But when I realized that part of the purpose of that second half of the book is to encourage, that changes the nature of it. Welcome to the broadcast. This is Michael Easley in Context, and it's a great day to have my friend, Dr. Witter, who's been a guest on In Context before. For those of you that don't know her backstory or know about her, let me give you a little bit of her bio. Uh, she has a PhD in Near Eastern Studies from the University of the Free State. She also has a master's in Hebrew and Semitic Studies at, from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She has an MDiv with an emphasis in educational ministries from Grand Rapids Theological Seminary. She's the author of a number of books addressing singles. She's authored, uh, co-authored other books on uh, Sunday school teachers. Uh, but the reason I go to Dr. Witter is for her expertise on the book of Daniel. And uh, we first connected. I was teaching through a series called The Big Book Cover to Cover, where each Sunday I preached an overview of one book of the Bible. And then I would... Uh, give a, uh, a a call out to a real expert on that book. Uh, of course, I'm a Logos Bible software user, and, and we have a great relationship with Logos. And so I reached out to uh, the folks there, and I said, who's the expert on Daniel? And in the one second, they said, Dr. Wendy Witter. And so uh, you were kind enough to come on uh, that broadcast and uh, help us out. But this is a deep dive. This is a new book. But first of all, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. It's an honor. Uh, the new book is called The Exegetical Commentary on the Old Testament, a Discourse Analysis of the Hebrew Bible. So right away, Dr. Witter, this is going to, um, let's say, thin the ranks on who this book is targeted for. So so give a little bit of a, a um, story about how you got into studying Daniel, your first commentary, which let's say is more accessible. Is that fair? And then this is the this is the uh, academic tome for those of us uh, who read a little Hebrew and Aramaic and probably Greek New Testament uh, who are a little bit more language oriented. So tell them a story about how you got into Daniel in the first place and where we are today. Um, well, the bottom line is I went where God sent me. Um, I landed in Daniel, my providence. Um, I was in my last year, well, I, I was finishing up my dissertation and um, I was needing to earn a little bit of money at the time and I also needed some experience on my resume. So I contacted uh, the dean at the seminary where I had gone and I said, so do you have any classes I can teach during the January term? And he fired right back, yeah, you want to teach the book of Daniel? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Uh, it was at the bottom of the list, the books I would have chosen, right next to Job, probably. Um, but I, of course, said, yes, I would love to, because it was via email, so he couldn't see what I was really thinking. And I got stuck there for a variety of reasons, um, and it just sort of became where I went, and I kept going. Well, let's see. I taught that first class in January of 10. So now it's been 13 years. Well, you know, in, in the military, they call them SMEs, subject matter experts. And so you've become a subject matter expert on the book of Daniel. Um, that book was in a series. Um, there were 21 books. Is that correct? In the story of God commentary. Is that right? No idea how many there are. No, There's supposed to be there one are. for every book of yeah. the Bible, so there must be more coming. <laughs> well, that, yeah, exactly. And um, and I think your book was number 20 in the series at the time. And that was primarily, as I mentioned, for a pastor maybe that doesn't know the languages, a Sunday school teacher, uh, Bible study nerds who just love the Scripture. Um, is, is, that, is that a fair way of explaining it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're willing to do a little bit of work, um, I mean, reading a commentary is not usually somebody's choice of book, first choice of book, it is still a commentary. Um, but I think it's accessible. And if you're willing, if you want to study and read and sort it out, um, I think you can take it for what it is and hopefully find some help. You know, with, with all the, the current interest in uh, sort of the world affairs, uh, I have some friends, uh, Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinney and Ron Rhodes, and they just recently did a TV series with John Ankerberg on eschatology. And I was emailing with 
Dr. Rhodes saying, you know, it's a different day. Um, cause when I was younger, prophecy conferences were kind of the, the bomb and then they kind of went away. And now we see this interest in end times for interesting reasons. But so it would seem in some respects, this is a great time to have an exegetical commentary on Daniel that comes out with uh, both the accessible versus, you know, the more critical commentary, I would call it, if that's fair. Now, since you're a Hebrew, Aramaic, and Semitic studies um, scholar, help those who don't know what that means, because we toss around ancient Near East and Semitic and so forth, but that sounds like, you know, nuclear physics to them. What does that mean for a person that's not accustomed to these terms? Well, he, uh, Semitic languages is a whole family of languages. So there's the Romance languages and Indo-European and there's language families. So the Semitic languages include languages like Hebrew, Arabic, um, Aramaic, which is relevant in the book of Daniel, um, and other languages in that part of the world. If you're in ancient times, you know, you throw in a couple others that no longer really exist. So the book of Daniel uh, actually uses two of those languages. So it has the Hebrew language, which is what most of the Old Testament is, and it also has a sizable chunk of Aramaic. So Hebrew, Aramaic are cousins, They're or even sister languages. They're very similar. The alphabet looks the same. So if you know one, it's not quite as difficult to learn the other. But they're in that family of Semitic languages. Yeah, I, I did... Um four years of Hebrew and four years of Greek and took some electives and at, still worked with my Hebrew and Greek until recent years or recent months, rather, when I retired from being a full-time pastor. But interestingly, um, it's a rich exercise, but it requires discipline, even for students in seminary. Uh, I love what Logos has done for us, but it's still, it, it's a different, you know, vein, Right. I mean, there aren't a lot of people that are going to say, oh, I'm going to learn Hebrew. I mean, they'll learn the alphabet and they'll quit. Yeah, I think one of the things I loved about studying the biblical languages, despite all the work that it was, is that I came come to the Bible from a rich Christian background and Christian education, and so much of it was familiar. But when you study the languages, you come to a screeching halt. <laughs> you are going word by word by painful word. And it really forced me to see things I'd never seen before. Um, and that, that's, that's the payoff for the work in the languages. I was listening to a commentary, uh, a Hebrew scholar, Mark, is it, uh, starts with an F, Furtado? Furtado, yeah. F yeah, uh, on uh, one of the Psalms, and I was just blown away with <laughs> You know, the very same thing you're saying, the word-for-word -word analysis that he's gone through. But anyway, let's get back to, to your book. One of the things I want to say to folks, um, th this is a niche book. Uh, it'd be a book to buy for a pastor or a serious student of Scripture or someone you know, perhaps right. in seminary. Uh, it's a great book to have on their shelf. But one of the layouts you put together of the Hebrew Aramaic, and not just the interlinear, but the English text, and then uh, kind of a, a rendering, if you will, it was so helpful, Wendy, to see that graphically. As a person who can work with the language somewhat, I was like, this is brilliant. Was that your idea, the publisher's idea? That's the pub That's the series. The entire series does that, um, at least the Old Testament side. I'm not. There is a New Testament series. I'm just not sure if they have the same format. But yeah, the emphasis is on the language and the words. And you, you say context matters. And this this series is all about literary context. How do those words fit together? Well, I, I commend whomever uh, with the series, and, and you obviously did all the spade work, but t to me, there's something about seeing that versus reading a commentary and parsing and chasing down BDB or whatever. Uh, this takes it to a new level for me to, to see it that way. Um, talk t t to me, uh, just want to give you a chance to define some things that people are not always familiar with. Again, we make presumptions. Genre. What does genre mean? Simply a, a kind of writing. So we're really familiar with genre, just maybe not the word. So if you are surfing the internet or reading a newspaper, you know exactly, or you hopefully know when you're reading news versus when you're reading a comic strip versus when you're reading an ad or an editorial. Um, you, you can tell because there are certain 
um, rules or expectations that you bring to a specific kind of writing. So uh, biographies, those have a certain kind of expectation. Um, in the Bible, we're talking about poetry, uh, narrative, which are stories, um, genealogies. Um, yeah, there's a dozen or more kinds of genres. So, so talk to us specifically about Daniel and genre. Well, the primary genre, Daniel's odd because it has two primary genres. Uh, the first six chapters are narrative. They're stories, uh, very engaging stories. And the second half of the book, which lots of people don't like to preach or read or do anything with, um, they are, they're set in narrative. They have a narrative framework, but they are visions. Uh, they are visionary literature, prophetic, apocalyptic. It's sort of this m mixture of um, genres, which is part of what makes it so difficult. Well, and we're going to get to that, you know, why most people don't certainly preach it uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, help also define, you, you use the term uh, macro units. Yeah, that's a, that was a choice by the editors of the series to use that. So if you, we're all familiar with verses and chapters, those are units. If you went to seminary, you know the word pericope, a, a section. Uh, macro units is just a larger section. So we're backing ourselves out and we're looking at a, a, a unit. So if you're in the Gospels, you could probably call the Passion Narrative a macro unit. Um, it, it's a larger chunk. Okay. And in the book of Daniel, so we've got three chunks. it's different from a pericope? Yes, It's different it's from bigger. a pericope just because it's longer? Okay. Yeah, for the All most right. part. Um, okay. The book of Daniel's odd because the first chapter sort of stands by itself. So it's both a pericope yeah. and it's a macro unit. Well... Let's talk about that for just a second. A sidebar question. Uh, I learned this in Hebrew uh, in Exodus. Many of our Old Testament books, the first chapter is a theological and often structural outline for the book. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair way of thinking about it. And in Daniel, I mean, for sure that's true. I mean, you see, even in the Gospels and Acts, I mean, it's a tremendous, uh, and again, it was one of these you know flat forehead discussions, discoveries for me, but Exodus, it maps out everything and and then it... yeah it's almost like a prologue you know it it tells it gives you introduces you to the characters to the setting to the themes and that's all in the first chapter of daniel okay uh, i don't know if this is a uh, uh publishers or yours but I, I do want you to define narrative because i hear this word tossed around inappropriately or i would say um incorrectly too frequently so help us understand. Yeah, in terms of biblical studies, I'm mostly trying to contrast it with uh, what it's not. So it's not poetry. Um, it's not a vision. Um, it's, it's the normal prose that we speak and that we tell stories in. So I, I stay away in, often from the word story because that often has a connotation of, well, it's not true. Um, narrative sort of gets rid of that. Let's not think about that. Let's just focus on what this account, what this um, story, <laughs> what it is, how, how it's working. How is the, how is the writing of this piece um, shaped in such a way that it tells what it wants to say? So what, yeah, I, I veered off from your question. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I, but, but it, the reason I asked the question was your exact point, because the story has become such a atrocious word. I, I'm not very diplomatic, never have been. But when I hear Christians use the word story, it's your story. It's God's story. I wince. And it's because of the misunderstanding of the term and how they're using it or think they're using it. And I think narrative falls in the same kind of the way the word is used has developed into something it's not. Because when we talk about narrative in scripture as opposed to didactic or poetic, or sometimes, as you've already intimated, they can be both at times. And that's just what I wanted our, our, our viewers and listeners to understand when you say narrative, what you precisely mean as you talk about Daniel. Yeah, most of the Old Testament is narrative. Most of the Gospels are narrative. It's just the, the normal way in which we speak and tell it's, it's the way it's the way the account is it, well it's the way the account is related yes 
this happened. This yeah. person spoke, Ruth and uh, right. It's Naomi a style of Bo, writing. Yeah. It's not a genre yeah. necessarily, but it's Thank a style you. of writing. That's what I wanted to be sure I was not wrong on. <laughs> You're not wrong. Okay. Uh, g- give us a brief introduction, explanation of oral tradition and when it becomes written. Yeah. So oral tradition, we have some of this in our culture, but we're a very... Um, writing obsessed culture even if it's just texting we we write we read and write but for the ancient israelites they did not have access to the sorts of things that we do and so they passed on their um histories and their traditions um by way of speaking so i don't know when most of the old testament at least was actually written down um, a lot of the books don't make a claim for when it was written down or who did it. And, and nor do I necessarily know how how long those accounts had been passed on. So, Well, we often say Job, we often say, excuse me, interrupting, we often say Job's the oldest book in the Bible. Um, and I, I find that fascinating at so many levels. But from an oral tradition to what we might call the Masoretic text or something, um, that story had to be told. And then of course this gets into inspiration and transmission errors and so forth and so on, because it's a big subject. Uh, and how we, and the preservation of the old Testament ostensibly is better than the new. Yeah. We have fewer copies of it at least, but yes, the, the Jewish scribes were meticulous about what they were copying and passing on. I'm sure you've been to the so-called Essene community and Masada in that area. The scriptorums, and I mean, the first time I, I really spent time there to understand the errors and why we have the so-called Dead Sea Scrolls. These copies were errors, and you know, you, you couldn't destroy them because you had written down the very words of God. So you put them in a clay crock and buried them in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's it's a fascinating field of of study, but the remarkable part to me is in the transmission of those stories that they handed down and when it finally was captured in writing and then of course you know far better than me the point system that's added later on which we would say equivalency of vowels um it, it's just remarkable and then when daniel you throw in some aramaic it's got to add a layer of complexity back up to the altars i think it's hard for us to get our heads around how that worked um because I think a common thought is, well, it must be like a game of telephone. How did they get it right? They're passing it on and passing it on. But that's coming from our context in which we don't do this. We have written things. We pass on books and we have our stories written in books. Um, but they they memorized a lot and their brains were used in different ways than we use ours. Um, so... To say that they passed it on for however many years before it was written down does not mean that endless errors entered it like a ridiculous game of telephone. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Dr. Alan Ross, who was one of my Hebrew professors, was brutal, uh, but great. And I remember him talking about the Psalms, which was his love, that um, even in pure time, Puritan times, you know, Princeton early days, you had to have the Psalter memorized for entry into these schools. And it, I remember him talking about, you know, we underestimate the brain of the ancients. We think of them as, you know, stone knives and bearskin rugs. Quite the contrary, they were brilliant and they did not have the distractions the Western culture has as you articulated. So I think it, it to me, it gives great credence, not only to the scripture, but to the men and women who were pious Jews, uh, who lived through the exile. You know, it, it makes it, not that we need it more alive, but you know where I'm going. It makes it more, wow, these people were amazing in their faithfulness and in their trying to live faithfully uh, through all the challenges. So anyway, I digress. Let, let's talk about, um, in parallel to this, um, on the one hand, um, uh, pastors will come up with some pretty wrong-headed interpretations. Daniel is, and we'll get into this maybe more in detail. They do, they don't teach chapter seven and beyond. And um, I don't want to be unkind or indelicate, but my reform friends tend to avoid 
the prophetic literature. They'll avoid this part of Daniel. They'll avoid Ezekiel. They'll avoid uh, that section, the sections of Revelation past the seven churches. Um, what's your take on that? And obviously, you've been a student of this for twenty plus years now. So I applaud you for for you know working with the text. But why? Why the avoidance, Wendy? Um, it's unfamiliar. It's an unfamiliar genre. I, I don't want to lump Daniel in with the same kind of prophetic writings as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and even Ezekiel. Um, it, it's a different animal. It's more like Revelation, which lots of people avoid. Um, it's apocalyptic literature, and apocalyptic literature is not something that we're used to reading. Um, it's full of symbolism. And this, a lot of the meaning of that symbolism has been lost to us. So sometimes we give it our own meaning, which isn't necessarily helpful. But one of the one of the goals of this literature, well, the primary goal of this literature was to encourage people who are suffering. It's the language of oppressed people. It's the literature of oppressed people. And the point was to encourage them with the that they're suffering so much and the only hope for their help is that God will intervene cosmically and punish their oppressors and reward the faithful. So first of all, this is a literature to encourage, and that gets lost a lot. Um, I think from my background, I was in some ways traumatized by what, what's in there. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to study this book, because there are so many views and competing ideas, especially about the second half, that it's a mess. It's just a mess. <laughs> um, but when I realized that part of the purpose of that second half of the book is to encourage, that changes the nature of it. So what is it about it that's encouraging? Well, you see who God is um, and what he's going to do, and you might have to hang on and wait for that. Um, but I the symbolism is difficult. Hands down, it's difficult. But um, okay, let me let me interrupt you again. We talk about symbolism and allegory, and um, I was trained in a hermeneutic, probably quite different than the way you were trained. And I don't think one's you know necessarily heretical, and the other one's perfect by any stretch. But when we use those terms, how does a person differentiate between symbolism and allegory? And maybe it's it's not either of those. Maybe it's the way God is explaining and inexplicable. Well, I think when I think of allegory, um, I think of like a one-to-one -one correspondence for all the things that you see in it. And that may not be correct. I haven't actually been trained in allegory. Um, but everything has a meaning. And uh, um, whereas the symbolism, uh, I, I like how Leland Riken talks about this visionary literature and how he gives some really helpful ways to approach it. And one of the things about it is that the symbolism was really meant to evoke emotion. And that is hard for us because we don't have the same reaction to the symbols that the ancient audience would have had. So Daniel's audience, when when he speaks of this vision he saw that had these four mutant beasts rising out of the churning sea, we're like, oh, what do those beasts mean? And who are they? And But you've got this churning sea. And in Daniel's audience, that was terrifying. The sea is terrifying. <laughs> Never mind the animals. It's the sea that's terrifying. So we lose that. We we have trouble um, replicating the emotion that they were supposed to feel. Um, so that's part of the problem. But I, I think another important thing, and Riken brings this out, is don't press the details. Try to understand the symbols as best you can, but don't necessarily think you have to find a meaning for everything in it. Because if the if part of the point is to evoke emotion, that might be just the point of some of the symbolism, um, not to represent as in an allegory, represent an exact thing. Uh, John Walvoord always uh, are often saying, you know, don't say what the text doesn't say. And uh, he, he sometimes went to conclusions that you would leave us scratching our head today in his book on Daniel. But in the main, his approach to prophecy was this is part of the word of God. And there is a lot in here that will teach us about the character of God, uh, how the people responded to God. And, and then it does raise the big question is why does God use these kinds of genre uh, 
for that audience. And that's why I appreciate what you're, you know, I'm a broken record on in context, because this to me is, is one of the ways we make mistakes unintendedly. We take something out of context and we say Gog and Magog is, you know, Russia and whatever. And, and, and we end up in a trap that the text didn't tell us that. And now we've got to go, well, anyway, I digress. Uh, let, let's talk, let me ask you this. Um, and, and from what I scanned in this part of the commentary, Daniel is a real historical figure. What about Nebuchadnezzar? And what do we know about what we would call extra biblical uh, in Daniel's world? Well, Nebuchadnezzar is a real person. Um, he's a historical, one of the greatest kings of the ancient Near East. And I think that's one of the one of the reasons he is so prominent in this book is because of who he was. Um, in the book of Daniel, I propose that Nebuchadnezzar is cast as the quintessential Gentile king. Um, he's really the focus other than God himself. Nebuchadnezzar is the focus of chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. But by the time Nebuchadnezzar leaves the book, he is praising the God of Israel. And God gives him all of his power back. So it's not that Nebuchadnezzar has all this power. That's not the bad thing. It's that Nebuchadnezzar didn't acknowledge where he got that. So by the end of his, when Nebuchadnezzar exits the book, he is basically bowing his knee to the God of Israel. And I love Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> because he goes from being, you know, the worst king. He's the one that destroyed Jerusalem. He's, for the Jews, he was no good guy. But by the time God is done with him, by the time God is ed done educating Nebuchadnezzar through his servants in exile, Nebuchadnezzar is the quintessential Gentile king who acknowledges who God is and what God has given him. Chapter 5 brings us Belshazzar. And Belshazzar is the opposite. And he becomes the paradigm for what a king ought not to be and for the worst of all kings. Uh, in the whole biblical story, Nebuchadnezzar is that proto, or sorry, Belshazzar is the prototype for all the wicked kings to come leading up to the Antichrist. Um, so in the book of Daniel, you have these two kings. You have Nebuchadnezzar, the quintessential Gentile king who bows his knee to God, and you have Belshazzar who thumbs his nose at God in defiance and becomes the model for the other kings that follow in Daniel and for the ultimate man of lawlessness in the New Testament. So it's this wonderful biblical theology at the heart of the book of Daniel. And again, it's lost because we don't look at the whole the whole uh, text. When when and Belshazzar is uh, also a, a real historical person. He's not known much in history. He's a, which is what's so delightfully funny about him is he's a blip in history. Um, he was the stand-in son of a usurper king. <laughs> so his father had usurped the throne and then was off uh, in Arabia. Um, he had probably mental health issues and had removed himself from the throne. And while he was gone, Belshazzar, his son, ruled for him. So he hadn't done a thing. He is he is a historical figure. He, he's ever so slightly known in history, but he didn't do anything. When uh, Charlie Dyer, Dr. Charlie Dyer is a friend of mine, and he had this very interesting story of how he got to go over when Saddam Hussein was rebuilding so much of this area. And um, I don't know if you've seen these pictures, but he had like a, a front piece silhouette of Nebuchadnezzar and him, Saddam Hussein. And he was making himself out. And it's remarkable uh, some of the you know, attempts that he made. I don't know if, you're, if you've seen some of those images, but it's fascinating. And, and to see what Babylon was and how he was trying to rebuild it, it just gives us an insight, again, into antiquity. Not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but anyway, again, I digress. Let's talk about these vision blocks. And again, is that an editorial the way the commentary set it out, or was that a way you decided to uh, organize? And that that was my way of organizing the chapter. Um, it was actually based on a, uh, a New Testament scholar's work with the book of Revelation, uh, Ralph Corner is his name, and he used this language. So I took it from him because it was really helpful for what's going on in Daniel. Um, so if you read the chapter, you find these repeated statements that's, that set off sections and they mostly are 
things like, I lifted up my eyes and saw. And then he says what he saw. And then I lifted up my eyes and saw. So you you have the section um, chunkified by these kinds of statements. So it's it, the vision Is that block, a Hebrew or a Mar- yeah, Aramaic yeah, word, well, chunkified? Uh, I got to write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> so the text helps break it up for us. And so I tried to honor the words and the, the way the the author put it all together um, by dividing it into those sections. So a vision block, the whole the whole vision block is, you know, what he saw, but then there are episodes within that. So that came from a New Testament scholar. Well, I, I found it very helpful, again, uh, reading through the PDF as much as I, as I could. Um, help us with some hermeneutic principles. We've talked about genre, just now vision blocks. We've talked about types a little bit, um, allegory or symbolism. But when you have a hermeneutic with a book like this, what are some principles, some rules of thumb that a, that a person might keep in mind? And then what did you do when you approached the prophetic parts of this, the vision parts of this? Well, in some ways, your your rules are going to change because the genre changes in the book. Um, so I deal with with narrative differently than with apocalyptic or with those visions. But even those visions are set in a narrative. But I digress. Um, I think, well, one of the basic principles is to recognize the genre and and read up on it if you don't know the rules of how that genre works um, and and how how as biblical students of the Bible we let the language use the genres of the time and we learn how they worked rather than bringing to it our expectations for what they ought to be doing. Um, and so when I read narrative, I approach it like I do other narratives in the Old Testament. You want to see the whole context. Um, how does this fit? It's sort of the concentric circle thing that that um, I've heard other people talk about. I didn't make this up, but you you know you have your your verse with your words, but that fits in a larger unit, in a chapter, in a macro unit, and how does that fit in the book? And you sort of work your way out um, so that you you can't ever become too lost in the forest. Um, you have to back out and you have to see the big picture. How does the book of Daniel itself fit in the biblical story? Um, I don't know that the hermeneutical rules change at the, from other books that you read. You you have the same set of rules. You honor genre. You respect the language. You study what the words are. You do your historical background. You do your archaeological. You do all of those things that you do for any other text. It's not like the book of Daniel is such an odd duck that we have to write a whole new set of rules for it. Well, and the reason I ask that again, I'm thinking of uh, maybe not the the seminarian who studied Hebrew in particular, they may not get to Aramaic depending on their course. Um, and when he or she is sitting down, uh, it, it's, a, it's a labor. Again, even with all the tools that we have at our disposal, a disposal, disposal, or maybe that was a, a, a Freudian. Uh, we have our disposal. Yeah, even with those resources, it it takes time to unpack this. And so, when I do Bible study methodology and teach it in English, it's one thing. When we're looking at the original language, uh, the I mean, you've already said it, but slowing down is the biggest thing. And then the constant exposure to that genre before I understand what's the author doing. That to me, it just takes a little more spade work than if I'm doing Psalms or if I'm teaching didactic literature. Yeah, because the, the units are are uh, different. Um, the continuity, and you already talked about the, these last chapters are very complicated, and some even think they're kind of a mishmash. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that is helpful when you look at the last half of Daniel, there are four units. There's chapter six, or sorry, chapter seven, chapter eight chapter 9, and then chapters 10 through 12. And if you are preaching the book of Daniel, um, I don't think you really need to say much about chapter 11. Um, It is a recounting of the history uh, of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies during the second... It's this detailed recounting of history that if you try to preach that exegetically, you know, that whole chapter, you are going to have walkouts. No one's going to stay. <laughs> and you might put yourself to sleep. 
it's really difficult and you miss the point. Um, part of the point of all of that is that God is in charge of this history. It's this incredibly detailed thing, but God is the one behind it. And so you have that, those hints. Um, so I, you have to, you have to be smart and be wise about which parts you choose to preach. Um, when you do chapter nine, which has the 70 weeks tacked on at the end of the chapter, the chapter is a amazingly beautiful prayer of confession. And that is 18 or 19 verses of it. And then you've got these four verses at the end, <laughs> the yeah, dismal the divides, swamp the of divide Old everybody. Testament. Yep. Yeah. You don't have to preach that or much of No, wait a minute. Come on, Dr. Ward. You do not. That confessional (laughs) prayer. Oh, my word. If you don't preach that, you have missed chapter nine. Well, let's say we do both. How about that? Okay. You can do both. (laughs) (laughs) But I think one of the things that helps, keep the big picture. And so when when I think of the big picture of the book of Daniel, there are two themes. The first one is take heart. Your God is in control. Your God is the one on the throne. And so when you slog through those visions, the point of those is to encourage the people, the original audience. We have to slog through them. They did not. The point was to encourage them that your God is in control. It doesn't matter what the world looks like. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Your God is the one on the throne. So take heart. That's the first part. The second part of this book is to stand firm. Because you know who your God is, you can endure whatever comes. So if you can keep that big picture in mind, take heart and stand firm. You've got the book. And at the heart of this book is chapter 7, which is this, you know, it's got a wacky vision in it, but don't miss the heart of the chapter, which is this wacky amazing vision. view. Dear Jesus, forgive Dr. Witter. She said you're a wacky vision, but I still love her. Okay. <laughs> well, no, the wacky part is the beasts, those mutant I know. beasts. But the contrast in the chapter is when this figure, like a son of man, this human figure enters the picture. And you have, I mean, it's a beautiful chapter. And that is the chapter that gives you what you have to hang on to through the rest of the book, because you don't get a lot of encouragement in chapters 8 through 12. The resurrection shows up in 12. you got a lot of muck to go through before then. Encourage our viewers and listeners. Here's a brilliant uh, Semitic scholar who's chunkified and slogging through wacky visions. Just so you know, she's a real person. Uh, you, you've kind of already, already done this, but um, I wanted to ask you, and anyone who studies at the, the level you do, or even a pastor that does a lot of homework, there are things that hit you hard or you go, I never knew this, and it enriches your life or it blows you away. I still remember some of the word studies I did early on when I was you know, learning Greek, and I, I can still tell you about kleronomias, 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 oh, all the inheritance terms. I mean, that was just a mind-blowing word study for me. And other ones, dipso, where Jesus says, I thirst. Uh, what what are, if, if you can, what are a couple, two, three of these that, you know, they were profound lessons for you personally. Well, I think the first one is that this book is not what I thought it was. Um, it is not a, um, a tool for charting the end times. It is a book that is meant to encourage um, and to give you a glimpse of God. And if we get lost in the details of what it might be saying about the end times, we will miss the book. So I think that was the first thing. I'm like, you know what? This is not what I thought it was. <laughs> This book is great. <laughs> um, the second thing is the the contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar just sticks with me because this book is about kings and kingdoms and the divine king and human kings and the relationship between the two. And that's for sure a theme of the whole Bible. And you have these Gentile kings. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar, you know, we say bad things about Nebuchadnezzar, but don't forget how he exits the stage. Um, he learns. Belshazzar refuses to learn. And you think he was a believer? I don't know. I'm going to leave that up okay. to God. But okay. I think he responded to God appropriately with the information He's, that he, he had. He says a lot of things that 
a couple of things that are awfully clear, but we don't know the behavior, right? right? Yeah. And, and in the book of Daniel, I think the point of Nebuchadnezzar's, you know, the portrayal of him is it wants to show him learning. He learns that Israel's God knows more than him. He learns that Israel's God has power. Who's, you know, who's the God who can deliver you from my hand? Ha ha ha. Well, it's Israel's God. And, and he learns. He's teachable. And by the end, he's been taught. And he acknowledges who he is before this God. And I also love how Daniel uh, responds to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel cares about Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and that's just such a such an example in some ways for how we should respond or approach our Gentile overlords. <laughs> um, Belshazzar is, is the paradigm for ultimately Antichrist. And, and just seeing how those two kings at the heart of this book cast that wide biblical um, perspective is is astounding to me. In the mo- in the divided monarchy in Israel, you see the same scenarios played out again and again and again. Of the of 38 kings, I think nine of them kind of land pretty well, but most don't. And uh, you see what he did, what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He repeated the sins of his father. Rehoboam, of course, is a disaster. And and you you look at these, you know. The, the Gentiles were no different than the Jews, or rather they learned it from them or all the above. But you're right, that theme is consistent, and there's going to be one king who does it right. And that's why I'm a firm believer in eschatology, because we're, we're given this picture from the very beginning, who's God? Me, who made you in my image, or you? And that, that is the battle throughout. And by the time we, you know, we want a king to be like other nations, okay. You're going to be like other nations. And uh, and then, of course, they're surrounded by enemies on every side. But anyway, I digress. You were going to say one more thing. Forgive me. Well, the, the last thing that has that strikes me every time I read Daniel 6, which is Daniel in the lion's den, um, is the contrast that the chapter makes between laws. You have the law of Daniel's God, and then you have the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be changed. <laughs> And it's it's setting these two things against each other, and the and the bottom line is that the Dan, Daniel's enemies thought, well, if he obeys the law of his God, ha, we got him; he's going to die. If he obeys the law of the king, he will live. But it's the opposite, and in the biblical story, that is always true. God's law is always life giving, and the other law leads to death. Um, from the beginning, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God's, God's law, God's instructions are always life-giving. Obedience to God's law brings life, and that's what it does in Daniel 6. Um, so I, I love that reminder, too. That's great. What, you know, as I've surveyed Scripture, I often talk about the Western notion of success, and we think about God's blessing and bigger, better, new, and more, and prosperity and all these other attendant things that are stuck to the idea of Western Christianity. And you think about the characters in Scripture, most of whom failed tremendously. Um, I often think about the most successful prophet in the Old Testament was Jonah, and he's clinically depressed and mad at the end of the book. Uh, and all the other prophets are begrudging and reluctant, and they, and they mess up. And, of course, I mentioned the kings earlier. Daniel is a bit unique, yeah, he's pretty squeaky clean. Yeah. I mean, he's not the focus of the book. Um, I, I, I would argue the only place where the author, the one who finally put this whole book together, um, draws attention to Daniel is in chapter six, where he's praying and we, we get this, we follow him. He goes into his house, he goes up, he opens the windows, <laughs> he kneels down. You're like, why? Why all the detail? Um, and he becomes a, a model for his audience, I think, of what it meant to be faithful to God. One more thing about apocalyptic literature. Can I just throw this in there? I think one of the reasons we struggle so much with Daniel 7 through 12 is because we are not, for the most part, um, in the position of Daniel's original audience. So those diaspora and beyond Jews who were suffering, this literature, these visions were life they were they were encouraging to them. We struggle because we're not there. Um, we live pretty comfortably, so the encouragement is sometimes lost on us. We're like, well, life's not that bad, but for them, it was. 
And so when they when they hear these visions of of cosmic change and upheaval, that's encouraging because that is their only hope. Um, but I think we're too comfortable to be able to appreciate the nature of apocalyptic. And I'm not wishing I'm not wishing it be otherwise, <laughs> mind you. But I think that's part of the problem with it. So we come to it and we look for other things it must mean when for that audience, this was really wonderful news. Um, it didn't matter the who and the what, the details. What mattered is that their God was going to ultimately triumph. Yeah, and it's, it's the repeated theme of Pharaoh and uh, Moses God. You know, who is God? Is Pharaoh God or is God, is Yahweh God? And um, it, it, again, I've always, con- I have contended for a long time that God made man in his image and we've been making God in our image ever since. And we, you know, this is the way it should work. And this, if A plus B and pro- prosperity theology is a terrible illustration of Western thinking. If then, if we do this, then that will happen. If we do this, we might suffer. If we do this, right. we may have cancer. If we do this, we may lose a spouse. If we do this, we right. may lose fill in a blank. And will we be like it? I, it's the old cliche, dare to be a Daniel. You know, will yeah. you trust him? Will you go up, open the window and pray? Um, yeah. So even from the uh, erudite, academic, wonderfully deep and rich, profound teaching, there's a simplicity, right, Mm -hmm. of what it means to be a faithful person who trusts God no matter what Mm -hmm. our experience might be. Yeah, I agree. Dr. Wendy Witter, we have, as always in the show notes, a number of links. Uh, One link we have in there is to her own site, and you might want to check that out because she has some great resources there, including a couple of books she wrote when she was a single young woman and thought she would probably always be a single young woman. And now she's a married young woman. Uh, but you also can find her, her, uh, two commentaries there as well as anywhere you purchase books, the new commentary, the exegetical commentary on the old Testament, a discourse analysis of the Hebrew scripture. Again, this is going to be a, a text for seminary students and uh, to provoke those uh, graduates who might want to tackle the book. Uh, Another thing that I want to mention, she has a a series of lectures that are on her site when she worked with the Logos. Logos has a mobile ed program, but you can look at a number of her studies and lectures there if you want, if that's a a way you prefer learning. And then of course the the new book, um, I mean her, her prior book on Daniel, which is a little more accessible. All that's in the show notes. Dr. Witter, it's always an honor and a privilege to have you on the podcast. So thank you again for coming back on the program. It's been fun.